This is CSAP Science and Policy Podcast, where we're bringing you the latest evidence and expertise to improve public policymaking. This week, we're proud to present the fifth episode in our series on science, policy, and pandemics, which is brought to you in partnership with Cambridge Infectious Diseases and the Cambridge Immunology Network. In this episode, our host, Dr. Rob Doubleday, is joined by Dr. Simone Schnall and Dr. Sander van der Linden. And welcome, everybody. I'm Rob Doubleday from the Center for Science and Policy. I would like to uh, welcome Simone Schnall, who's reader in experimental social psychology at Cambridge and author now of Coronavirus, A View from Behavioral Science, the blog, and Sander van der Linden, a lecturer in psychology also at Cambridge, who's director of the Cambridge Social Decision Making Lab. So thank you, uh, Simone and Sander, for joining us. In terms of introductions, I don't really need to, to make the point that the pandemic we're living through has human behavior and human psychology at its very heart, both in terms of, of measures to try and manage, reduce uh, the infection and manage the infection, and then of course the harms that those very measures will have on, on individuals and, and communities. We're going to explore what, what the discipline of psychology, social psychology, ha- has to contribute and hear from Simone and, and Sandra how they, how they see the current situation. So with that brief introduction, I, w- I want to start by asking both of you really, just in a few minutes to highlight what you feel for, from the point of view of psychology characterizes the real kind of stresses and tensions and that, that, that people will be living through at the moment. So Simone, if you want to start. I think the field has a lot to offer terms of trying to understand people's experiences at the moment. And as you're saying, um, the virus situation, the COVID-19 situation affects people on so many different levels. And one way of thinking about it is to consider the kind of resources people draw upon all the time. And by resources, I mean very concrete things like money, material resources, but also the kind of psychological resources we are aware of, namely social resources, social support, social connections. We know those are very precious to people. We know they have various positive health benefits. So for example, having a closely knit social network has protective effects against all kinds of illnesses ranging from heart disease to cancer to the common cold, all kinds of illnesses. If you have a close, if you have good social relationships, that's good in many ways. And then of course, in the current situation, another key challenge is to people's health. And we're of course always very attuned to anything that could be harmful, that could be unhealthy, dangerous, and so on. So so that is right now the most concrete threat that people are dealing with in terms of the virus. But then there are also all these other considerations for one thing related to the social resources, social connections that are now of course compromised due to the social distancing and so on. And then also the resources on the more financial economic level where many people are afraid of of losing their jobs or they already had hours cut down they're under furlough and so on so i think we're really i mean we're dealing unfortunately with a situation where people are getting hit from all directions psychologically speaking so it's a very tough situation and and sander you i know your research focuses on kind of public discourse social media and the kind of quality of democratic debate and and how do you see and how does your research kind of suggest that Will, will the, the kind of stresses that we'll be living through will be intensified? I completely agree with, with Simone on, on some of the factors that she mentioned. You know, to me, the, the, the pandemic is, is as much as a behavioral pandemic uh, as it is a, a viral one. So, you know, a virus can only survive in a host. And so it's, at the end of the day, it's, it's people interacting with other people that underlies the spread of the virus. And so the solution uh, really comes down to the behavioral science, I think, in terms of how we think about human behavior, not only the biological science in terms of, yes, a vaccine is going to be hugely influential, obviously, um, but also people's behavior. You know, we're in a basic social dilemma, which is a situation where you have to sacrifice um, a little bit of what's in your personal interest versus what's in the interests of the collective. And so you get into really interesting discussions about um, well, if I stay home and and stay home from work to you know help protect those who are vulnerable, who's going to take care of me? Because you know I don't I'm not receiving any income at the moment, or I might be struggling. And so there's all these inequalities uh, that occur at the same time. And so there's lots of interesting social questions um, 
about how people are thinking about this dilemma from a human behavior problem. Because at the end of the day, we're going to need to coordinate billions of individuals around the world in terms of their behavior. And that's really the challenge we're facing now in terms of these preventative health behaviors and trying to control the spread of the virus. And mixing with that is this idea of trust in science, trust in experts, the information people receive. What's ironic is that social networks are hugely important for our social capital, but one of the major sources of misinformation is actually coming from people's social media network, uh, not the mainstream media. It's coming uh, through people's personal networks. That is really eroding the public discourse and public debate about the role of evidence in society and the role of evidence in government, conflicting signals between the government strategy and that of the uh, you know, WHO and other public health organizations is confusing people, which is contributing to this lack of coordination and cooperation amongst everyone that we need to actually solve this, uh, this pandemic. So I think this you know, infodemic uh, aspect is really important in in trying to come to a solution to this. And and you know we saw there was this this headline the other day. You know people are attacking public health experts now, which is really dangerous. I think because if we're not trusting uh, public health experts in terms of what they're what they're saying, uh, who knows what what people are going to end up uh, believing? So I think that's that's really concerning. Um, and you know the government is uh, paying attention to to behavioral science, but not perhaps the wider. Um, the wider spectrum of, of behavioral science and uh, empirical testing of, uh, of what the public uh, thinks, taking into account, you know, public opinion polls. And so lots of interesting things to talk about there, too. Great. Well, thank you both for sort of set, setting the scene and, and emphasising the, the scale of the challenge. On the basis of your, your, your expertise and your research, what sort of positive steps would your research support? I think we all have to acknowledge it is a challenge uh, for anyone. I mean, whether expert or non-expert, governments, policymakers, scientists, to 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 give very clear-cut recommendations, to to offer solutions. I don't think we have very good solutions at the moment. So we have to approximate what we know about the literature so far, try to apply it in in useful ways, while being aware of the limitations and the caveats that we have to keep in mind, rather than saying, here is what you do, here is your solution, go for it. Uh, I think we have to be really nuanced to say that, well, we have a certain knowledge base, but at the same time, the way science works, and perhaps that's something to keep in mind in general, the way science works is we have certain findings, we find support for a hypothesis, that's not proof. So sometimes people talk about, research has proven that such and such well we never prove anything we find evidence for something we find you know support for something but then there might be counter evidence as well so so all this is to say it is it is kind of complicated and um it's it's not always um easy to give a solution now as far as specific research goes though so so my line of work um that's quite relevant here is on what's been called moral elevation and that is a feeling, an emotional state that people experience when they are witnessing a selfless act done by someone else. So it's a very beneficial behavior, something altruistic. And that's the kind of thing when we observe it, it, it feels uplifting, we feel inspired, we feel like we also want to do good things. So it's the kind of thing if there is um, basically a moral role model, we feel like we want to be like them. So for example, we've done work where participants saw a video clip of the Oprah Winfrey show where somebody was brought on who served as a mentor for some um, uh, underprivileged children and those uh, one particular person then went on to become very successful. And then these people were brought onto the show and they were highlighted in terms of this mentor in terms of his selfless contribution and how he had made such a big difference for this young man. And what we found afterwards was that the participants who had watched the video compared to control videos, they engaged in more helping behavior, but in a completely different domain. So this was not a mentorship domain, but uh, in that particular case, they helped an experimenter with, with a boring task. So the experimenter made clear she needed help and participants were free to either offer that help or not. And after they had watched that really inspiring film clip, they were more likely to, to, to do so. So that's to say, 
sometimes when we're exposed to these morally upstanding people, those who uh, act in selfless ways, it could be in everyday life, it could be political leaders, we then feel motivated to also do something good. So, so that is something that could potentially be harnessed here, where one highlights the contributions of people, of others who, who, do, who do exceptionally beneficial things for other people, because it does come down to that social contract that Sander was mentioning, that my, my sacrifice, however small it might be, but it, it is a, a certain sacrifice that I uh, limit my social interactions, that I do things that interfere with my personal happiness, and I, I need to keep in mind that I'm doing it for the greater good. So when we see other people doing that as well, that then can prompt people to also follow these kinds of norms. Sander, do you want to sort of uh, talk about, from your research point of view, what sort of measures you think would be helpful? Just to reiterate what Simone said, we just finished a, a survey in 10 countries with the Written Center for Risk on Evidence Communication with David Spiegelhalter here, here at Cambridge. And one of the biggest predictors we found of people's risk perception of COVID-19 around the world is their pro-social worldview. So this was measured with the question of, you know, to what extent are you willing to make sacrifices for the larger, the greater good of society, uh, which was one of the most important determinants of how risky people think the situation is, this kind of understanding that there's this fundamental trade-off to be made. Um, and that, that I think, is, is, is really interesting. I also think what Simone said about behavioral science is, is a really good point. I think when it comes to evidence, you know, it, there's all kinds of preprints and, and, and urgent signs online now that is difficult to evaluate for journalists because it's, it's not peer reviewed and, and you need experts kind of to help try to, you know, interpret and disseminate what's, what's, what's legitimate and what's not. And I think a great example was, was the government's reliance on this concept of behavioral fatigue, uh, which is a behavioral science concept. Um, and the idea that people would get tired of, uh, of self-isolation, it's called isolation fatigue or media fatigue. And it's a real thing, but there was absolutely no randomized control trials relevant to informing policies based on that notion that I've seen or, or, or were aware of. And the evidence that was cited was actually more about the, the negative um, effects on mental health of staying isolated, which are real and, and important. Uh, but the idea that people get tired of it, there, there's just no good evidence based for it. And I think the best, the most important thing, rather than that informing a policy, the most Probably the most accurate thing would have been to say, we don't know how long people are willing to self-isolate. That's the honest answer, we don't know. But we have uh, lots of reason to believe that we can motivate people um, to, to follow public health guidelines using uh, insights from behavioral science. Uh, and I think that's perhaps the, the more sort of interesting uh, conversation that we can we can draw on insights from, from behavioral science, but, but we need to do the the research to evaluate it. And then on the misinformation front, I, you know, there's been very interesting discussions about how impactful fake news is. So some scholars say that, you know, there's lots of fake news out there, but it's not really affecting people. And we just did a, a survey of how people um, endorse um, a wide range of fake news about COVID-19 uh, with the Witten Center here in the UK. We found, you know, the, the idea that the virus was bioengineered uh, was one of the most popular ones. Um, Whereas the 5G conspiracy was one of the least endorsed ones. And you see generally only minorities endorsing these kinds of statements. Uh, but people are burning down masks uh, in the UK and across Europe. And so there's this difference between, you know, what percentage of the population needs to believe something versus, you know, actual damage occurring uh, in, uh, uh, that can have domino effects. So I think it's, it's a mistake to suggest that fake news needs to be widespread in order for it to have negative consequences. And one of the things that we've been doing to try to prevent that from happening is something called inoculation, which is trying to preemptively expose people to weakened doses of the techniques that are used to manipulate people online. And it follows the vaccination metaphor, just as you know, injecting yourself with a weakened dose of a virus triggers the production of antibodies to help confer future infection. Turns out um, you can do the same thing with misinformation by exposing people to a severely weakened dose uh, of some of the strategies that are used to deceive people, for example, propping up fake experts to peddle homegrown cures for COVID-19, um, and make people more attuned to those techniques and be less likely to du be duped by them. And we have developed several interventions that, you know, some of them are used by the, the, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office here in the UK, who's helped translate our, our, our game called Bad News in 15 different languages. Um, and so that intervention is live, it's active, and we are, we are continuously evaluating it. Um, which is kind of an interesting exercise 
um, that is basically a simulation that takes people through what it's like to produce fake news in an attempt to immunize people uh, against some of the uh, some of the strategies. Uh, but again, it, it requires continuous testing. We've updated it with COVID scenarios to try to evaluate how how well it works and to advise government on on what they can do. But I think the bottom line is this: that the government's always react. There's always a sort of fact checking and debunking after something has happened. Whereas whereas this approach is preemptive. It's all about trying to proactively and preemptively prepare the public. Thinking about potential vaccine, for example, I can already anticipate that there's going to be conspiracies about the COVID vaccine. We can think of all sorts of misinformation that's not out there yet, that will be out there, that we can inoculate people against now, not after the fact when the damage is already done. Uh, and I think so much of communication is really about preemptive, preemptively preparing the public for what the government is thinking, rather than informing the public afterwards, which can also cause psychological reactions or non-compliance and critiques and so on. Um, so I really think, and I, I really think that they could do more of this sort of Reactive communication and anticipating, preparing people uh, preemptively, um, and being open about uncertainty. This is one of the other things with David Spiegelhalter in the big study we did that people can handle uncertainty about facts. You know, rather than pretending that that we know something to be 100% true, this is the amount of deaths that occurred. That's not true, right? There's always a range uh, of uncertainty around any number, and we find people can handle that that uncertainty. It makes for more accurate communication, and it might, you know, it might even, we didn't find that it boosts trust necessarily, but it didn't undermine it either, but perhaps being more open and transparent will build public trust. Do you think people will find it easier to endure the lockdown if they have a sense of the exit strategy? In other words, an idea of, of what's to come. That whole uncertainty about how long it's going to last is probably, psychologically speaking, really, really challenging. But then I, I fully appreciate that it's difficult to predict what's going to happen. And part of it is also the fact that what has to be done in the future depends on people's behavior now. So I think there's that real dilemma here, that if we tell people one thing and that has a certain effect on their behavior, then, of course, whatever we just said, will no longer be true. Having said that, I do think yeah, people are able to process information. They are able to understand you know, complexities if, if you give them all the information, if you're transparent about it. Because of that, emphasize the fact that, well, whatever you're doing today will influence how long this is going to last. Because, well, here are the numbers. Here, if you run the calculation, if everybody did what you're doing right now, here is when we can lift the restriction as opposed to if nobody does it, then it'll go on for much longer. So I think there is something about knowing how long certain negative consequences will be in place or challenging situation, and then we can cope with it. Whereas if, if that's not, if there's too much uncertainty and lack of knowledge, that, that does make it challenging. But it's back to the idea that if you're transparent about why the government is making these decisions, that, that can have a really positive influence. It's about thinking about how to best present the, the, the weight of the evidence to people in a way uh, that they can digest, but being honest about the range of, uh, of things here, but not overwhelm people at, at the same uh, time. So I do think that, you know, as, as what Simone was saying, it can be a very bad strategy to, to tell people to focus on the, uh, um, on the, on the here and now with, with false promises about the future. And I've seen leaders do this quite often, like, oh, it's going to be fine. We're, you know, we're, we're on our way up. Just a few weeks, just a few months. And if you have to keep revising that, people are going to stop trusting and believing uh, what you're saying. And so for that reason, I think it's very important uh, that the government thinks very carefully about um, what they tell people um, about the future in a way that is not going to undermine uh, trust in evidence and, and in projections, because the projections are uncertain. They do depend on people's behavior. And so we need to, you know, think about that and how to best communicate that. Um, but not communicating anything, I think, is also not a great strategy because people do need to uh, understand what the strategy is and why they're doing what they're doing. You know, one of the reasons why in Asia uh, this has been effective is because the government goes door to door and provides people with supplies and everything they need uh, uh, during the pandemic. Whereas, you know, here people have questions like, I'm not, how am I going to be able to get this? Uh, I need to go do that. Uh, there's no preemptive communication about how the government is, is addressing some of the things. They might not know, in which case it might be, you know, fair to wait until they do know. But again, it's about preparing people with, with proper uh, communications uh, to, to continue uh, to engage in adaptive behaviors uh, to, try to, to try to solve this uh, dilemma. So if you look at data from the U.S. and the U.K., the public understanding of the U.K. strategy and the U.S. strategy is really poor. Whereas in Germany, people seem to have a very crisp understanding of what the, the government's doing. Uh, so that's, you know, th those are some interesting comparisons.
what do you think the impact of the current collective effort will be on social values and social cohesion over the long run? So, I think that's a that's a great question. And to some extent, if we look around in the world, how this has been playing out, we see very different type, different prototypes, right? So what Sander was saying, Germany seems to do very well and people are on board with the mission. People are trying to comply. If you look at the United States, it's a completely different picture, right? Where there is now protests against uh, the, the coronavirus measures, which is quite striking and one doesn't really see much in other countries. So, and then one can ask, well, why is that the case? And then I suppose the obvious answer is, well, it dep depends on what's coming from the top. I mean, what, what is the message that the government is putting out? How much is there a perceived sense of cohesion and one clear message as opposed to division and putting political interests first? So I think in a way that's that's pretty straightforward. So, so it, it, it has to come from the top. These kinds of, these um, leadership ro uh, roles are exceptionally important in these times where it, there has to be a sense that first of all, all the right information is in place, the science is solid, the facts are solid, but then also a sense that the person in charge is willing to put everybody else's interest first. They're also willing to make sacrifices. They know it's not easy for them for, for anyone. So for example, I remember when Angela Merkel gave her speech that was announcing the lockdown, she talked about how for her, having lived in Eastern German, East Germany, where there were travel restrictions all the time, I mean, where basically one couldn't travel outside of the country at all, how for her, that was such a precious thing in a democracy like Germany, and to then take that away from her own citizens, it, you know, she, she fully appreciated just how massive of a change that was. And I think that, um, I will say that was a very good speech that really brought across that we're all in this together, but it, it all depends on what the message is that comes from the top. That's the bottom line. You recently completed a study in India. Could you tell us a little bit about that? We've just done a study in India on the on the people's curfew that was imposed. That was a voluntary curfew that was recommended by the government before the mandatory curfew came in a few days later. And there were a couple of interesting things going on, among which was basically what in the UK has been called a celebration of um, clap for carers. That was a really interesting event. And we, we studied whether that kind of event would increase people's intentions to follow the COVID-19 uh, prevention measures. So things like social distancing, uh, hand washing, and so on. So we compared people's intentions on engaging in these behaviors before that clap for carer celebration. And then again, afterwards, to our surprise, those intentions actually were lower after the celebration than before. That was a bit puzzling. And now thinking again about, you know, what do we know in terms of psychology and so on? One possible interpretation is that when governments ask people to do too many different things, such as following a curfew, engaging in all these health promoting behaviors, and then also putting on that clap for, clap for carers, that once you comply with one such request, you may feel less motivated to comply with another request. So this is what's been called uh, moral licensing. So doing one good thing makes you feel like you've done enough, or at least you've done something, and therefore you don't have to do additional good things on top of that. So I should I should caution, this is this is some very recent work. We still have to follow it up and substantiate it. But that's to say that sometimes things are more complicated than what one would think from the literature. So, so, you know, trying to cover all the bases, getting to people, getting people to do lots of things. And of course the clap for carers celebration is a very positive thing, but um, in many countries we've seen it occurring spontaneously, as opposed to if it's something that the government puts on and says, okay, now here is yet another thing you're supposed to be doing. Um, that can have unintended consequences. How do people's material situation and their trust in governments impact on their ability to cope with the social distancing measures? My, my quick sense is that, you know, public trust in, in official institutions is really important for how people respond to the question. So maybe a parallel strategy can be how to build trust 
uh, in the government's response strategy to COVID-19. But I think the message is uh, uh, generally to focus on how we can help each other uh, are useful, uh, but we also have to consider the fact that people are not doing so well. And again, in some countries, the government's preemptively uh, given people information and supplies to deal with those populations, um, and government assistance in that is crucial. I think one of the things that we hadn't thought about carefully, which is you know a really important part of social psychology, is social psychology of inequality, is that it's easy for, for someone to say, I'm gonna stay at home and you have a nice yard and you have enough supplies and you have a big bank account, uh, but if you're struggling um, and can't work, don't have income, don't have resources, um, your inclination to be pro-social uh, might go down quickly uh, if you're struggling yourself. Thanks. Yeah, I would I would add to that in terms of trust in the government. Of course, if people don't trust the government right now, well, that'll be hard to build it up in time for it to be useful as far as the crisis goes. But then another possibility is to bring in trustworthy individuals, right? Like in the in, in various countries where there are health advisors that people trust. Uh, Fauci in, in the US, for example, is very respected from what I understand. Uh, and so maybe governments can then, you know, widen the team or widen the kind of expert base uh, in order to increase that sense of trust that people are getting. So where it's not just the leader in charge, but there is a broader uh, broader group of experts that that can be built up such that that the general public feels trusting towards them. What do you think the impact of information overload is on people's stress and ability to cope? I mean, we're all exposed to information overload. That's been the case ever since the, the internet has grown so quickly and social media have taken off. There's always new information coming in where it's difficult to determine whether it's valid or whether there is a good evidence base behind it or not. And I think it's become especially uh, prominent now with, well, with, with the crisis, the COVID-19 crisis and lots of findings being put out. Yes, it increases stress to be exposed to so much information, but one way of filtering down the information is to be very careful about where it's coming from and who has evaluated it. Why do people disseminate misinformation? There's a difference between those who spread misinformation um, uh, for a living and those who are duped by it. Um, so two motives for why people spread uh, fake news is financial and political. So some people spread news because uh, it advances their political agenda, and some people do it to make money off of it. The reason why it goes viral is because lots of people who are vulnerable to it uh, keep sharing and resharing it on social media. And they might do that because it immediately speaks to how they feel about the world, or maybe just because they're not paying attention because they're overloaded with information and they just kind of share headlines without really thinking about it. Um, but there are certain actors involved in, in COVID-19 production of misinformation that uh, that's interesting to know that there's been Russian disinformation trying to steer this debate. There's been the anti-vax community who's been heavily involved in disseminating fake news about COVID-19. Climate denial community is very active. So there are um, specific actors that are producing this disinformation that dupe people uh, partly because of political and partly because of financial reasons. And I think that the job is to try to protect people from from being duped by it. Thank you very much, both. It covered a lot of ground. I mean, I think really what it highlights, and I've been very struck by, you know, how insightful and interesting Simone and Sander are. But of course, they're drawing, as Sander was saying, on, on behavioral science research that it always needs to be understood in in context and is not straightforwardly predictive. And so, when one thinks about the relationship between behavioral science and government action, particularly where the stakes are so high. It seems to me what one needs is is a constant dialogue, you know, which may be difficult, but then you know, it seems that behavioral science offers great resources to think through, you know, what are the implications of particular actions, what responses might particular actions generate or not generate, with with what knock-on consequences. And it seems that behavioral science has so much to offer to help. You know, governments and others think through the conditions we're in and think about how to evaluate and weigh up different options. Thank you both from all of us very much. We'll be back next week to discuss how the pandemic is impacting on young people and adolescents. CSAP Science and Policy Podcast is a production of the Center for Science and Policy at the University of Cambridge.
This series, Science, Policy, and Pandemics, has been produced in partnership with Cambridge Infectious Diseases and the Cambridge Immunology Network. This episode was hosted by Dr. Rob Doubleday and produced by me, Kate McNeil. Our guests this week were Dr. Simone Schnall and Dr. Sander van der Linden. You can learn more about CSAP's work by visiting us on Twitter at CSIPOL or by visiting our website at www.csap.cam.ac.uk. If you have feedback about this episode or questions you'd like us to address in a future week, please email inquiries at csap.cam.ac.uk. Thanks for listening.